Good morning. It's so good to see all of you. As you've heard, today is Racial Justice Day throughout the World Church. If you have received your Herald this week, I got mine a few days ago, so I'm sure that you did too. I hope you have looked at it. If you haven't, I encourage you to open it. You'll notice that it's devoted to justice this month, which was perfect for today. And within the Herald, in the middle of it, there are about six articles on racial justice. So if you haven't read them, I encourage you to do so. I think they're all wonderful. And in, in addition to the six articles on racial justice, the editorial is written by Stacy Cramp. I guess you know by now, she's our president designate. And she has a wonderful article about making the world a more inclusive one. So be sure you take a take a take time to look at those. At our last world conference in 2023, the World Church adopted a resolution on racial justice. It's a rather lengthy document, so I'm not going to read all of it to you, but I do encourage you to get on the website and read it in its entirety at some time when you have a chance. I am going to read a little bit of it to you today. I'm going to read the resolve sections. I'm not going to read all the whereas sections, but you're going to hear the resolve section. So let me share those resolve sections. This is what we say we're resolved to do. Be it resolved because Jesus has declared God's love for all the world and creation. Community of Christ acknowledges that racism is a sin. And be it further resolved that community of Christ now calls for a renewed commitment, both in the church and national cultures, to eliminate institutional racism and to affirm unequivocally that by biblical and theological precept, by the law of the church, by our mission and enduring principles, by world conference annou announcement, and by leadership expressions, the aim of community of Christ is nothing less than an inclusive church in an inclusive society. And be it further resolved that community of Christ calls upon all its members, congregations, and jurisdictions to perform and share those faithful deeds of prayer, study, discernment, worship, love, justice, and nonviolent advocacy by group and individual actions in both the church, community, and nations, which will bring into reality a just, equitable, and peaceful world for all people. When we look at the state of our world today, that seems like a huge undertaking, almost an over under overwhelming undertaking. But that's what we are resolved to do. To put that resolution into practice, the World Church this fall offered three workshops based on diversity and inclusion that were offered over uh, on the web online. I was privileged to be able to attend all three of those workshops. So today seems to be the perfect time since this World uh, Racial Justice Day for me to share just a teeny, teeny, tiny little bit of what I was exposed to in those workshops because racial justice is a huge, huge topic. We were exposed to a lot, but beyond the workshops, we were encouraged to read three books that they listed uh, for us to, to read in conjunction with the workshops. They were all three written by black people. They were wonderful books. I have read them all. Uh, well, wait a minute. I guess I have to confess. I didn't read them all. <laughs> but I listened to them all because my eyesight has gone down dramatically in the last month. And 
it's been going down for a while, but it's been very dramatic in the last month. And so I really can't read print anymore and I can't see numbers anymore that are in a book. So my husband, bless his heart, said, I can read to you because I like to study. I've always been a reader. So he stepped up and so he's been reading and he read the, the, the major part of those three books to me. But that's not all. He's still reading other books because I still like to, uh, to read other things too. <clears throat> So we have our little bright nightly reading sessions. Now we have a new normal at our house as Lila adjusts to not being able to read anymore because that's a very sad thing for me. But one of the books that we read together was How to Fight Racism by Jamar Tisby. He's a master of divinity graduate of Notre Dame University. And at the time that he was writing this book that I'm going to share with you today, information from it, it was 19, uh, 2021, and so it's a, it's a rather recent book. And at that time, he was a PhD candidate in history at the University of Mississippi, where he was studying race, religion, and social movements in the 20th century. He says, and these words may be hard to hear, but he says, whether we will be willing to admit it or not, we are probably all guilty of making racist comments and performing racist deeds off and on at different times in our lives. I know we don't want to, admit that. I think he's probably right. Racism is such a part of our culture that we don't even realize it when we are saying things that are racist or doing things that are racist. In this book, Mr. Tisby talks a lot about how to orient our lives toward racial justice. He says racial justice is a lifestyle, not an agenda item. In this book, he lists three, what he calls essential understandings to practicing racial justice. And those three things are awareness, relationships, and commitment. We're going to explore those three concepts of his, his essential understandings today. And I'm going to share with you examples that he cites in his book for each of those. The first was awareness. So we're going to start there. He says, often a lack of awareness results in racial injustice, racial injustice. And let me tell you a personal experience that he had that really opened his eyes to the fact that he lacked awareness. As a black person, he had to learn that despite all of the things that had happened to him in his life as a black person, being discriminated against at, from time to time throughout his life, that he could still get it wrong about race. And so this is what happened to him that opened his eyes. Mr. Tisby earlier in life was a middle school principal. And he had a beginning teacher in his building who was struggling with classroom management. Now, let me tell you, struggling with classroom management is not unusual for a beginning teacher. That happens to be something they don't teach you in college or at least they didn't teach me when I was in college. And from listening to Cassandra, Cassandra, are you here? Good, I, th I heard you were supposed to be here. From listening to Cassandra talk about her student teaching experience, which she has just completed, I think that's still true. I don't think they teach you enough about classroom management in college. They don't, Cassandra agrees with that. That's something that you have to learn on the firing line when you're in the classroom. And so he was determined that he was going to get this teacher, a beginning teacher, off to a good start. He didn't want her to be struggling. So he would visit her classroom and observe her from time to time, and then they would have a conference. And he would point out things that she could do to improve her classroom management. Well, whenever they would talk, having a little conference, he noticed that the teacher would always look sideways. She wouldn't look at him. And he didn't think anything about it at first. But when it happened time after time after time, it began to irk him. 
And finally, one day he said to her, could you at least look at me when I'm talking to you? Well, after school, that teacher appeared at his door and said, could I come in and talk to you? So he said, come in. So she said, there's some things that I need to tell you. She said, as a person of Asian descent, in my culture, it is considered rude and disrespectful to look at an elder or a boss in the eye. That's why I don't look at you when you talk to me. He was shocked because she was trying to show respect to him by not looking at him. And he was asking her to, by looking at him to show him disrespect in her eyes, a real quandary. He quickly apologized to her and said, I, 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 I'm so sorry, I had no idea. And I commend you for having the courage to come in and make me aware. I'm sure that that's an experience that he had had long ago probably influenced this book that he wrote, where the first thing he said that's a basic understanding of racial justice is awareness, because that made him aware of something that he had no, no idea about. Anyone can get it wrong, and that's true about racial justice. The key is to accept the fact that you've made a mistake, learn from it, and then proceed on down the path of racial justice. In Matthew 7, 3, Jesus confronts those who would self-righteously judge the shortcomings of others while ignoring their own flaws. The scripture says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in the other's eyes and pay no attention to the plank in your eye? In our journey toward racial justice, we must always self-monitor ourselves to see if we are enacting racial racism, even though it might be unintentional, and seek to change our attitudes and our behaviors. As Jesus points out, you hypocrites, first take the plank out of your own eyes, and then you will see clearly how to, to remove the speck from your brother's eyes. Humility always leads to better ways of loving one another. The second workshop that I had attended focused on identifying microaggressions. Microaggressions need to be identified so that we make a culture of belonging. A microaggression, if you haven't heard that term before, I really hadn't heard that term until I went to this workshop. But a microaggression is a term that's used to, uh, to describe commonplace verbal behaviors that communicate hostile, derogatory, or subtle attitudes toward stigmatized or marginalized people. <clears throat> the comments are often subtle and maybe unintentional unconscious, but you never know. But attending this workshop really perked up my ears listening for microaggressions. And I heard one not too long ago on the radio. And it was made by the governor of our state. The governor of our state said that the people of his political party in Washington, D.C., when they were trying to select a new speaker of the house, were acting like a bunch of wild Indians. Now, in today's society, that's a microaggression. Now, I don't know if that was intentional, but it certainly would affect Native American people. I hope he wasn't putting down Native American people. Maybe it was an unconscious thing. But I can remember when I was a kid growing up, that was a, an expression that was often used. Oh, you're acting like a wild Indian. And I know I'm a lot older than he is. So I don't know. Maybe in his bringing up that he also heard that and that just popped out of his mouth. 
I hope it was unconscious and unintentional, but if it wasn't, he needs to remove that from his vocabulary. Because comment, comments like that can have a profound effect on the people, people's mental health and their well-being. If they're on the if you're on the receiving end of one of those microaggressions, it's important to be mindful of the language that we use and the actions that we take. We must work to create an inclusive and welcoming environment for everyone. Another essential understanding to practice racial justice that Mr. Tisby talks about is relationships. And he says, relationships are different for people of different races. And he has an expression that he, that he stated in his book that says, keep the light switch on. Now, this is what he meant by that. He says, a light switch can be turned off and on, off and on at will whenever you want to do it. But there's a lot of difference between a light switch and a smoke alarm. A smoke alarm has to be on all the time for it to be effective. So he says, for white people, racial justice is like a light switch because we can turn it on and off and on and off at will whenever we feel like it. But he says for black people, Racial justice is much more like a smoke alarm. It has to be on all the time for them to feel safe and out of danger. For white people, he says, race is hardly an issue, a factor in our lives. But he said for black people, it's always a factor in their lives. The last, or the third, and it is the last of his three essential understandings, has to do with commitment. And he says, people of God have a mandate to give a portion of their wealth to the work of justice. And then Mr. Tisby tells about a man named Graham Smith that he was aware of who secured a very lucrative job right out of college on Wall Street as an investment banker. Now, when he was in college, he remembered that one of his professors told him and told the class that he was in, I want to warn you about something. He said, beware of the golden handcuffs. And this is what he meant by that. The idea is that you can become so tied to making money and living a luxurious lifestyle that it actually becomes a prison, preventing you from doing something that might be less lucrative and uh, cause you to have to live in a different way than you would otherwise, but it also might be more beneficial to you and to others if you chose to live that way. Mr. Smith took that warning to heart and he made a commitment that as he started that new job on Wall Street, making lots and lots of money, that he would not live a luxurious lifestyle like most of his peers were doing. Instead, both he and his wife chose to live a simple lifestyle, living on 10% of his income and donating 90% of his income to racial justice. Now, I understand that you might say, yeah, 10% of his income, income would be pretty good. And it may well have been, I don't know. I don't know what his income was, except Mr. Tisby said it was big. So anyway, that was what his choice was, that he was going to live a simple lifestyle, not the luxurious lifestyle than most of the people he worked with lived. And in on top of that, I said his wife bought into this too. In 2017, his wife started a vegan restaurant. And 
she was also committed to making life better for others because she only hired people to work in her restaurant who were formerly incarcerated people or homeless people. Now think about what that what a difference that would have made in their lives to have been someone who couldn't get a job because people who've been in prison have a hard time getting a job. Homeless people have a hard time getting a job. And all of a sudden they were offered a job. It would change their lives dramatically. And they also made the commitment that any uh, profit that they made from that restaurant would also be do donated to charity. Now, I realize that none of us make a Wall Street uh, salary. I don't think we do anyway. I don't know of anybody that I, unless you've really been fooling me. <laughs> but, uh, but in spite of the fact that we don't make that kind of a salary, there are still things that we can do. Remember, grace and generosity is one of our enduring principles. So there are ways that we can give to others on a smaller scale than what Mr. Smith and his wife did that will make a difference in the lives of others, make their lives less stressful. You have no idea how much stress a lot of people in the world are living under, unless you really stop and think about it. Look for the little things that you can do to make the lives of others better. We are blessed to be a blessing to others. Then there was another way that he said that we could make a commitment to uh, practice racial justice. He suggests that we can fight racism in our country, in our world, if we refuse to platform people who make racist comments or commit racist deeds. That may be hard to hear. Well, this is something that happened. This is his illustration of doing that, of refusing to platform someone who makes racist comments and performs racist deeds. There's a small town in Georgia. Cassandra, you're about to move to Georgia. There's a small town just southwest of Atlanta, Georgia, where Cassandra's going to move, that has a population of 2,000 people. Well, those, that, that town had a mayor and a councilman after they were, were elected to office by the people of their town. Those two people, and they happened to be white people, started making racist comments publicly about people. Well, the people of that community, you know, a small town is, gets to be pretty close with everybody. The people in that community decided that they were not happy with their leader's comments. And so they said they were going to issue a recall petition to remove them from office. Well, the mayor and the councilman saw the handwriting on the wall and they resigned from their positions before any action could be taken on the recall petition. But because of their racist views, even though they had been elected to office, they ended up losing the privilege of their office because of what they were spouting out of their mouths. And Mr. Tisby says that should happen. If people are spouting things that are racist, then they should not be in places of leadership. But he said, everybody has a chance to make changes in their lives. And so he says, if they don't refuse to change, if they can make changes in their lives, then that's fine. But people, he says, who blatantly say comments that are racist and perform racist deeds and refuse to change should lose their platform. Everyone can, can change and everyone has that chance. But until that happens, that's another way that we can practice racial justice, Mr. Tisby says. I'm going to close with the last paragraph, paragraph of his book. These are, I think, good words. He says, we are people of hope. Hope is not 
blind optimism. It is a realistic assessment of the current conditions with faith that tomorrow can be different. We are people who believe that a brutal, unjustified murder resulted in a resurrection. We believe that a poor carpenter from Nazareth conquered death and is forming a people who will join in this triumph. Each day that we live is the opportunity to be witnesses to the resurrection and the coming of the kingdom of God. We pray and work for that kingdom to come and for God's will to be done, not just in the sweet by and by, but here and now. The journey for racial justice continues. The music we hear along the way is festival music, leading to a banquet of blessings and a harvest of righteousness. Today is today, today is the day, and now is the time to join the journey to racial justice. We've done a lot of talking in our country about racial justice, but it's time to quit talking and start taking action. Amen.